friends and our beloved congregation, those who are with us in this holy church and those who are watching us through live streaming, may the Lord Jesus bless you. May the Lord Jesus guide you, protect you, and deliver you from every evil tribulation, whether it be visible or invisible. Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ always. Good times, bad times, in health and in sickness, in poorness and in richness. When we're fallen and when we're back on our feet, when we're weak and when we are strong, when we go through dark tunnels and when we are standing in the presence of the light of the world, we thank the Lord. The Gospel of today is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 to 14, inclusive. Luke 18, verses 1 to 14, inclusive. The Lord Jesus gave two parables. The Lord Jesus gave two parables in these 14 verses. And between the two parables, he tied them with this saying. When the Son of Man comes back again, will he find faith on earth? He's asking a question. And when the Lord Jesus, when he ever asks a question, it is a rhetorical question. Because God does not ask a question because he knows everything. The reason why us humans ask question or questions because we do not know everything and the only way for us to find out we must ask a question. So whenever the Lord Jesus asks a question, it is for us, not for him. It is for us to find out he is saying, when the Son of Man comes back again, will he find faith on earth? That means he won't. He won't. Because he knows exactly what's going to happen in the end. For he is God. The first parable. There was a certain king. There was a king in a certain city. This widow used to come to him every day asking him to vindicate her from her adversaries. And he would refuse. And she'd come back every single day asking this king to vindicate her without prevail. One day, after getting sick of her persistence, you know how people, when they are too persistent, can be a pain. So after being persistent, the king had had enough. He said, this time I will grant her her wish for her just to go and let me be in peace. And the Lord said, have you seen what this unrighteous king had done he called them the unrighteous and then the other parable two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee the other a tax collector the, the Pharisee stood and lifted his eyes to the heavens and he said I thank you God for you have not made me like the extortioners like the adulterers, the murderers, and like that tax collector over there. Thank you, God, for not making me like that tax collector. For I fast for you twice a week, and I give tithes every time I receive a wage. Out of the one out of ten, the tithing I give you too. And I fast twice a week for your sake. And by the way, the Jews, till this very day, they fast twice a week, Monday and Thursday. 
We fast Wednesday and Friday. I know some churches only fast Wednesday and Friday on the Passion Week. But the good old Orthodox like me, like my face, an old face, we fast every Wednesday and Friday throughout the year. Every Wednesday and Friday, we become vegetarians. So this is passed from the Old Testament. On the other hand, the tax collector, putting his head down to the ground and beating on his chest and saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, I the sinner. Have mercy. The Lord Jesus said, truly I say to you, this tax collector went home being justified more than the Pharisee. For he who ever exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. The 14 verses, one word, me. I sum it up in one word, me. The Lord tied the two parables with the saying, when the Son of Man comes back again, will he find faith on earth? No, he, you won't find faith on earth because, Lord, at the end of the time, when you come at the end of the world, in your second coming, people would have denied you totally. Why? Because people, in the, in the end, they would say, we are gods, no longer the true God is. And the ultimate God in the human level is the word, I am, me, 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 me. I am the ultimate God in this realm. And this me is that king in that certain city, the first parable. And this me is that Pharisee that stood and raised his head to the heavens and judged everyone but himself. This is the real me. I am the greatest sinner of all and I am the greatest enemy to my own self. Me is the worst and the ultimate and the most powerful enemy that can be against me. Me is the enemy of me. There are three enemies that we suffer from. Every single one of us suffers from three enemies. But there is one that surpasses all these three enemies. One enemy, sin. Second enemy, death. Third enemy, Satan. And I'll add another one, condemnation. Four. But there is the fifth. So there is sin, one of the enemies. Condemnation, another enemy. Death, another enemy. Satan, another enemy. But the ultimate enemy and the most powerful of all these four is me. I am the worst enemy to myself. We tend when we make a mistake, we tend to blame every man and his dog except me. I stole, but believe me, it wasn't my fault. That guy deceived me. I had fun, but it wasn't my fault. Certain friends ruined my life. I killed, but I had no choice. They forced me to kill. If he had shut his mouth, I wouldn't have killed him. It was his fault, not mine. Judge. <laughs> when are we going to stop blaming everyone and start blaming myself 
before I blame anyone. When will the day come? When will the day come we stop pointing the finger at others? When will the day come we stop blaming everyone and we begin to look at our own mishaps, our own wrongdoings, our own foolishnesses, our own inequities, our own sins? When? When will I just come straight in a very simple, straightforward way, bow before the Lord and say, Lord, there is no one in this church who is a sinner except me. Everyone in the church is a saint. I'm the only sinner, Lord. I came to beg you for mercy, for there is no one as a greater sinner than I am. I am the worst kind, Lord. If you are looking for the ultimate and the greatest sinners in the world, you ain't going to find someone more wretched than I. Have mercy on me, Lord Jesus, for I am the greatest sinners of all. The greatest sinners of all. Every problem, problem in the world is because of me. Every problem in the church, the ultimate, the foundation to all problems, it was because of me. This is my throne. Nobody takes it away from me. So I will kick my brother out for me not to lose this throne. The main reason for the church became divided was the throne. Me, I am the king. Remember, the Lord said there was a king in a certain city. I am the king. I am the pope. I am the head of the church. I am the head of Christendom. All Christians must follow me, must come to me. It is me who is sitting in the place of Christ. I represent Jesus Christ on earth. I am Christ on earth. It is me. Listen, you say you are a sinner. Humble yourself and call your bro your yourself as a brother to other many brothers who are at the same level as you. You are not special for everyone to bow before you. My goodness, how have we misled the flock? We have blinded the flock for our own glories. You know what the solution would be for the universal church? When I say universal, I say Catholic Orthodox. With all love and respect to the Protestants, there's a lot to be fixed before we sit down and talk. With all love and respect. All church leaders Patriarchs, popes, Catholic and Orthodox, all of them, you know what they should do? And I'm saying it with utmost love and humility, utmost love and humility. They should forget about these thrones and sit on the ground. All of them. You're a patriarch, sit on the ground. You're a pope, sit on the ground. But we must do it from the heart, not from the lips, because I can, I can deceive people, but I cannot deceive Christ. I can lie to people, but I cannot lie to Christ. We sit all on the floor and forget about who is supreme, who is not, and become brothers. Embrace one another in a brotherly way and say to one another, we are brothers in Christ. 
we are one i am not greater than you the pope of rome is the same as the pope of alexandria the pope of alexandria is the same pope and the patriarch of the greek of the russians and every other apostolic church we must confess to one another and say we are equal there is no supremacy the supreme is christ no one takes his place no one no one i wonder now here is the question <laughs> Are you not stepping down from your throne because you are defending the true faith? <laughs> My dear friend, you're not. You know why you're not? Because your deeds are not showing that you are defending the faith. Your deeds are reflecting something totally contradictive to the true faith which Christ gave to his 12 apostles and the rest of the world. So you're not defending the true faith. Well then, you're not stepping from the throne because of me. Because I am the king. I'm not going to be equal to someone else. Everyone must bow before this king. Sometimes this piece of wreck speaks and it may sound across as offensive but i pray it's not the case i pray it's not i mean well believe me but when are we going to please the lord when are we going to make him happy when when he comes again too late too late before we speak about theological indifferences we must give up on the throne first you see it is not us who unite the church it is Christ and Christ will unite it when he sees humble servants when he says humility we pray for that day to come very soon we pray my beloved me is the worst enemy of me adam broke God's word because of the word me God said to him do not eat from this tree he said no I will eat the I am that is in every human being is the factory where all other sins are manufactured the I am is the factory where in it every other sin is manufactured you see, it is, the, it is the me that manufactured pride. Even the angel, the highest level in the angelic order, who is called Satan now. This Satan had the ultimate rank in the angelic order. Because of the I am, he allowed for pride to come in him and challenged God and wanted to be like God in heaven. Pride. Pride was the very first sin that made the angel and the human race fall into perdition and disappearance. Pride is manufactured in the factory of I am me. You see, the me in me is so powerful, even to God I say no. Even to God I say no. Why do children disobey their parents? Because they don't like what parents say. Boys and girls, an advice from your spiritual father. 
Listen up, open your ears and your eyes and your hearts and your minds and your souls and your spirits in Jesus' mighty name. Listen, son. Listen, daughter. Me is so powerful, especially at youthhood. I'm a teenager. I'm in my 20s. I'm in my 30s. When I walk, I shake the ground beneath me. It's a free country. I can go wherever I want. I can do whatever I want. I can be with whom I want. There is no one neither on earth nor in heaven that can tell me otherwise. Mom, dad, I'm not going to listen because I'll do what I choose to do because I am right to my own self. Who are you to tell me otherwise? Who are you? I will do what I want and mom and dad, this is Australia, this is a free country. You don't like it, tough luck. And the boy and the girl go out their way, choosing things their way, doing things their way. My question to every one of us, where do they end up 100% without fail? Absolute destruction they hurt themselves they destroy their future and they hurt their parents a child that is disobedient to mom and dad is disobedient to God himself and when you disobey God don't ever expect prosperity you will expect one thing absolute destruction and by the way, when I say parents, you need to listen to them, not just any parents, because the Holy Bible did not leave one thing unanswered. Parents, discipline your children in Christ. So a parent that teaches their children wrong things, he has not she has not fulfilled their duties as mom and dad. They haven't. They failed. A father or a mother that teach wrong things to their children, they are not worthy to be mom and dad. A father and a mother that teaches their children outside of Christ, you are teaching them wrong no matter how good it may sound. You're teaching them wrong. You see, the future of you parents and the future of your children is Christ not to be a doctor, not to be an artist, not to be a professor, not to be a scientist. It is to be the servant and the child of God. This is the ultimate future you need to secure for your children. What does it benefit for me to be the Pope and I don't know Christ? What does it benefit for me to be a professor and I have no fear of God? There are so many scientists, there are so many professors, there are so many wealthy and rich and successful people in this world, yet they have no God in their life. They have failed miserably. I'd rather be a street beggar and I have the fear of the Lord. I'd rather clean the toilets and sweep the floors and be the son of God instead of being the king of a, of a country and be the, and the, be the slave of Satan. What future are we looking for? My son, my daughter, when you disobey parents, when you go out and do things your way, there is one thing awaiting you. Darkness, disappearance, destruction. Absolutely guaranteed, guaranteed. Don't ever do things your way. Don't ever be stubborn and say, it is either my way or the highway. Don't ever do that. I beg you, I beg you, I beg you. Christ must be always your objection, your objective, sorry. Christ must be always your goal, your objective, your destiny, your aim, your target, Christ. You've heard us say this before. 
and I'll say it again. There are three kind of cultures, no more, no less. Three kind of cultures. There is the theonomous culture, there is the hedronymous culture, and there is the autonomous culture. These are Greek words. Theos, God, nomos, law. Theos, nomos, culture. It is God's law culture. Hedros means another, nomos, law. Another one's law culture. And there is the autos, nomos, culture. Autos, self, nomos, law. Self, law, culture. If I ask all of us, what kind of a culture is the 21st century? I'll say 100% without thinking twice about it. It is an autonomous culture. It is my law culture or no one else's. I do whatever I want. I want to be a male, a female or in between or whatever. I can go out naked. I can do this. No one can tell me what to do. I can choose this. I cannot choose this. I want to believe in God, not in God. You're free. It's an autonomous culture. But guess what? Autonomous culture is a self-driven culture. Who is the self? Moi. Me, me. You know what the problem with the autonomous culture is? One problem. Tolerance is not tolerated. Because when it comes to individualism, guess what? No one is the same as the other. Why? Because God created you to be unique yourself. There is no one else exactly like you. Your fingerprint, no one else has it. There is about 8 billion people in the world and out of the 8 billion, no one has your fingerprint. And you tell me the Big Bang created you? What kind of a madness is this? God created you, you. And there is no one like you. Since there is no one like you, guess what? The way you think is not the way I think, is not the way the next door neighbor thinks. So when you come and live a life your way, you will listen to no one. You will accept no one else's advice because everyone is different to you. So the son is not the father, the mother is not the daughter, the brother is not the sister, the husband is not the wife, the, the neighbor is not this other neighbor. Everyone is unique. So when everyone talks, everyone will talk differently. There will never be tolerance. There will never be agreement. There will never be peace. A person that lives their way, they will always be in division when they look inside there is no peace there is emptiness there is chaos there is insecurity there is disorientation i'm lost i don't know which way to go which way not because you are doing things your way that's why you are lost and you'll always be lost until you come back and say lord what would you like me to do for you then you'll find your peace. Until then, there is no peace. And look around you. Look at the world. Isn't the world always in turmoil? Always. It's not just now. It has always been the case from day one. Cain got up and killed his brother Abel. There was two guys in this entire world. Man, there was plenty of properties to be divided between the two. What are you fighting on, brother? You have the whole globe. No. It's my way. Boys, Don't ever think 
Freedom is when you can do whatever you want. This is not freedom. This is the core of slavery. I told you this true story which I experienced in my life with a family because they called me to their rescue. So I actually saw the whole thing. And I've mentioned and I shared it with you during you know, Bible preaching sessions. This mother that has two sons, her husband passed away while she was still very young and very beautiful. She lived in a country somewhere in the Middle East. When her husband passed away, she decided not to get married in order to raise the children. She did not want to bring a stepfather lest he be a harsh one toward her children. She avoided this fearing for the well-being of her children. She said, I will spend the rest of my life living for my children, not for myself. She sacrificed to the ultimate. She raised them till they become young men, fearing for their life, for their safety, for their future in the Middle East. She tried frantically every way possible to bring them to Australia in order to provide a future and a better life for them. Finally, she managed to bring them here. One day the mother calls me. Father, please come. The house is being ruined. My youngest son has become the worst enemy to his mom. This youngest son used to adore his mother. After Christ, it was his mom on earth. Whatever mom said, he would jump. He would never question her. He would never re reply back to her. Only with a yes, mom. Whatever you wish, mom. The youngest son, he was like an angel on earth for his mother. He started mixing with so-called, the good old friends. Friends, aloha, friends. Man, I wish someone comes and defines for me who is a friend and what is a friend. Can you define? Do you understand what this name means and what it carries and entails? Do you understand, my dear friend? So he started mixing with so-called friends, teenager. 16 years of age started going out son please i'm worried about you i looked at the faces of your friends and i'm not comfortable my son i am your mother i am older than you i am more experienced than you my son i beg you i'm not happy with these friends don't mix with them don't go out with them didn't listen he went out she couldn't stop him. Australia, he'll call the police. Poor mom and dad. Well done. Freedom. The Western world spiritually is dead. The Eastern world physically is dead, but spiritually is alive. If they had used their head in the East, they would have saved both spirit and body they don't use their head they let the west come and run the show but the west is dead spiritually what are they going to do destroy the east and this is exactly what they did oh my goodness <laughs> son i can't stop you from going out please come back at 10 p.m okay mom first day 10 p.m after two weeks, 12 p.m. After a couple of months, 2 a.m. After six months, the second day. After nine months, three days later, it, it rock up at home. After almost a year, he's been missing in action for a week. Mom has no idea where he is at all. One week. 
She called me. I went and I spoke to him. I said, what has become of you? I know you. From you were a baby. You were, you were absolutely wonderful to your mom. What happened? Your friends destroyed you, yes? Come to church. Okay, father. He came once, twice, three times, disappeared. Anyway, after a year or so, he was caught by police. He had mixed with a bunch of people that were very troublemakers, big times. I went and met the barrister. He said, We need all the help from the community, from churches, from everywhere. He's still very young. And I know how hard his mother worked for the safety of her children. I know. So I, I asked the barrister, I said, so what, what is the case? What do you think is going to happen? He said, if the judge gives, his, gives um, her son 15 years imprisonment, the mother should consider herself extremely lucky. 15 years. She should consider herself extremely lucky. It was a huge case involving a lot of things. Weapons, drugs, everything. It wasn't a joke. Three and a half years, the court case was on, going on in the Supreme Court. For three and a half years. This young man was in prison awaiting the outcome of the court proceedings. Now obviously when you go into a Supreme Court, the judge is not working for free. He's not your friend. And then your lawyer, your barrister, and if you're going to bring a QC because it's a very, it's a very deep case, you know what, you come and say hello, you got to put twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 every time you say hello. She spent over $400,000 on court proceedings. The boy remained in prison three and a half years. On the day for the judge to pass his sentence, everyone was praying for the mother more than the son. While he was in prison for three and a half years, who visited the son? Only mom. Where are your friends? They all disappeared. None of them come and see me. I thought they were the best of the best. I thought they are the ones I'm going to trust for the rest of my life. They let me down at the most crucial moment of my life. I've realized now the only true friend that I truly have had all my life was God in heaven and mom on earth. They were the true friends. All the other friends in the streets are nothing but a lie, 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 lie. But you see, why do I choose friends in the streets over my mom and dad? Because of me. I want to do this. Who are you to stop me? The boy learned his lesson, but the hard way. The mother used to tell me when I went to visit my son, he would cry like a baby and say to me, Mom, I am begging the Lord Jesus. Wow. Now he came to his senses and started thinking of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the ultimate friend, the ultimate friend, and the only true friend. He said, Mom, I am begging the Lord Jesus, begging him with tears. Lord, just give me another chance and get me out of this prison. Not for my sake, for my mom's sake, I want to come out of prison. I deserve prison and more than this because I did everything wrong under the sun. I disobeyed you, Lord, and I disobeyed the very mother whom gave her life for me to give me a future and a life, sacrificed her life. She did not get married again to raise me and to make me a better son for God and for herself. Lord, I'm begging you another chance. This is all I'm asking. You know why, mom, I'm begging the Lord to give me another chance? I want to come out to you, mother. 
For every moment I broke your heart, I want to heal it. For every moment I made you cry, I want to make you laugh. For every moment I poisoned you, I want to fill you with sweetness. For every moment I disobeyed you, I want to salute you and say, whatever you want, mother, it is done. I'm coming out and I'm begging him so that I can pay you back and compensate you for all the losses that I have made for you. Three and a half years, the day came for the judge of the Supreme Court to bring the hammer down and give him his sentence. He said, and thereby I sentence you, the, 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 the barrister said 15 years, mom should be lucky. Therefore, I sentence you to three and a half years imprisonment and you've already served that, go home. Slam the hammer. The boy left that day with mom. When he did it his way, he destroyed everything. When we do it God's way, we fix everything. The world is godless. Look at the world. It is the biggest joke you could ever come across. It's even funnier than that joke that says, the skinny guy said to the fat guy, what's going down, brother? The fat guy replied and said everything. It's funnier than this one. It's funnier than when the husband turned to his wife and said, honey, yes, darling, Remember 20 years ago how happy we were? The wife thought about it deeply and turned to the husband and said, but hubby, we were not married 20 years ago. He said, exactly. This world is even funnier than this joke. Yet they think they are smart. Lord, give me patience. All the big boys, all the big boys, they want to go to Mars and live there. They want to go beneath the ground and build cities. They want to plant veggies and fill them with poison to reduce the world's population from 8 billion to around 1 so we can control them better. We just want the elites. We don't want the little elites. The, the, the liabilities we don't want. We want people that are productive. No more center link. Everything is going to be a chip. We're going to cut your payment. And when we cut your payment, what are you going to do? You're going to go and steal? You're going to cause us more trouble. So what we'll do, the best solution, kill you, brother. Get rid of you. So these geniuses, these geniuses that worship the biggest genius of all, Satan, the dumbest of all, Satan, the most ignorant of all, because you cannot be any greater of an ignorant when you lose God. This is the ultimate ignorance, foolishness, and blindness when you become the reason for losing God himself. Satan is ignorant, foolish. How could you? You had the best of the best. You were the highest rank in the angelic order. Look at you. You've gone so deep and so miserable and so ugly and so filthy. What has become of you? Is this what you really wanted look at you what has done to you when you chose to do things your way not god's look at you now you are satan you are dark you are going to hell and it's exactly what will happen to every human when we do it our way not god's will end up where satan is this is only fair 
Choose the light. In the book of Isaiah, the Lord God says, I have put two ways before you, two paths. There is the life and there is the death. Life and death. There is the light and there is the darkness. Choose life in order to live. Choose the light in order to walk in the light. Don't choose darkness and expect the light to be shining on you. Me is the problem of everything. If it wasn't for me, I wouldn't have been boastful about myself. If it wasn't for me, I wouldn't have been so stubborn about things. You see, when this me is so vividly clear in me and so strong in me, I will listen to no one. I cannot be obedient to no one, including God. Because me will bow for no one. Will bow for no one. It's amazing. Every time I ask one of my beloved deacons, what time is it? They always say 10 to 8. Amazing. Like I've timed myself. It's incredible. The Pharisee judged the tax collector. The Pharisee, an elite in his community. Tax collector despised in his community. One is respected so highly and one is despised so lowly. One is loved, one is hated. Wouldn't you hate the guy that takes your money? You'd love the one who gives you money, not take it away. So the tax man is not loved. And especially at the time of the Lord, they were hated. You know why? Because they were appointed by the Roman governor. So no one would check on them. No one would check their records. They were absolutely free to whatever they wanted. So Caesar said, take a shekel from every Jew. This tax collector would go, because nobody checks on him, he says to the Jew, give me four shekels. You like it, you like it. You don't, I'm going to report you. You're avoiding tax. Tax evasion is a federal offense. But the system they put in these Western world, <laughs> if you go by the rule book, you'll end up with nothing. They have to be fair and square. But where is fairness in the world since Satan is the ruler of the world? Satan can't be fair. He's selfish. So they would ask for shekels. I don't have it. Tough luck. You give it or I'll take your life. So they would give one shekel to, uh, to Augustus Caesar, the Roman emperor, and three shekels in the pocket. They were very rich people. So they were hated by the Jews. So this guy went as a tax collector, hated by people. This guy, ooh, he is a Pharisee. He is the man of the law. He gives me advices when I need an advice what to do in the spiritual life. Wow, I love this man. This man thought he was something special. So he started judging other people and belittle them. God said, that tax collector in my eyes was justified and this Pharisee was not because this Pharisee exalted himself, but the tax collector he humbled himself. So when you humble yourself, I, the Lord Jesus, will exalt you. Don't ever judge others. Don't ever point the finger at other people and say it's your fault. How about you point it at yourself? Because you know what? Every time you point the finger at someone, you do, you, have, you make this gesture, right? You close this and you have one finger, this finger here. You point it like that. When you point the finger at that person and say, your fault, there are three fingers pointed at you. Have you realized this? <laughs> Anybody home? <laughs> -na 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 -na. You are a genius. You are absolutely incredible. Look at you. Hey, it's your fault. It's your fault. But it's, it's my fault three times moreover. So every time you judge once, you're judging yourself three times.
So next time, it was uh, my fault. I'll leave you with this. I have to. I, I, I have to take this opportunity. I'm not going to let you go that easily. What are you rushing for? Mm, you want to go out with your friends? I kill you. My name is Ahmed. Allah Akbar. Boom. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to follow you to those places you guys go. Where do you go? Where? Where? Are you going to go downtown, brother? You're going to go clubbing? What a noise pollution, man. You're suffocated in that dark, ugly place. Boom, 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 boom. And you have, I don't know, tequila, maquila, shakila, paquila. I don't know what you're drinking. And you're spending all this money. And you come out. Oh, what a great night. What? Ash on your head. What great night. This is an absolute miserable night. Come with me, brother. I'll take you out, baby. I'm gonna take you out for a trip of your life. We are gonna have fun, bro. Lay me some skin. What's up, brother? I'll take you out. To a very romantic place, spiritual retreat. Isn't that romantic? Sitting at the feet of the Lord, contemplating on what I've done in my life, the good and the bad, what I've achieved and what I failed to achieve. Contemplating. Contemplating, my beloveds. Do you know why children, this is what I'm going to leave you with. Do you know why children disagree most of the time with their parents? I'm not going to say always, but most of the time. You know why? For one reason. If someone asks you, what is the definition of life? What is the definition of life? In a, in a nutshell, in a simplistic way, I'll say the following. Life is experience and knowledge life is experience and knowledge experience parents have knowledge children have so when a child speaks to the parent the child speaks with what knowledge they have because they do not have the experience because they are not parents as yet all they can speak based on is knowledge they do not have the experience parents in return they speak to their children based on experience not knowledge there is a humongous difference between experience and knowledge you go to a doctor with all love and respect to doctors and you'll say i have a pain in my tummy Imagine this, the doctor never had a pain in his tummy or her tummy. They have the knowledge about the pain and what causes the pain in the tummy. But they, they don't have the experience of what pain is and to go through that pain. To go through it, live it every single moment, that is called experience. To only read about it and know of it, that is called knowledge. You cannot have the same level. Parents speak of experience, children speak of knowledge. Mom and dad, can you please stop being a pain in the neck? You don't know what you are saying. Maybe mom and dad are not that educated. Maybe mom and dad never went to university. Maybe mom and dad, they are even illiterate. But mom and dad who are illiterate have experience. You, my dear son and daughter, who has graduated from uni and now you're a doctor, you don't know anything of what mom and dad have experienced through their, throughout their long journey with ups and downs and dark tunnels, so many of it. You don't know. 
Mom and dad, look at, the, at your friends. They can read them through their faces. They can read them if they're good or not. So mom and dad speak with experience. Children speak with knowledge. Two different levels, they never meet. So what do we do, children? We need to listen to those who are experienced in life. Imagine an alcoholic goes to another alcoholic and say, what do you think if I should give up on drinking? What do you think the alcoholic is gonna say? Oh, my, oh, oh right now? Well, I think scotch on the rock is the best thing. What do you think the alcoholic is gonna tell you? Stop drinking? No. They're gonna say this is the best thing you've ever done. So you go to your friend, friend, what do you think? We sit in the car and bring some girls with us and have the sabufa khabibi in the back seat and drive 120 miles an hour. What do you think? Your friend, what do you think is gonna say? No, let's go to church? No, of course not. He's gonna say, of course, brother. Now this is, now you're talking. Church is for the oldies, the pensioners. With no teeth. <laughs> Son and daughter. Respect mom and dad. Fear the Lord. Remember the Lord in your life. Come to church. Don't walk away from the Lord Jesus and his holy house. Be close. Encourage your friends to come with you to church, not to the club, not to the street, not to McDonald's, not to dark alleys in the city, not to Star City Casino, not to clubbing, not to the Novotel. Don't let anyone to pressure peer, appear you. Don't let anyone to put you under pressure and say, hey, if you're a man, come on and drink this and take this. I'm, I'm, I'm not a man, okay? I don't want to take it. Thank you. You don't want to call me a man, so be it. But I'm not drinking this, I'm not sniffing this, I'm not doing nothing. And, and so be it, I'm not a man. Fine. Because a true man, a true man is the one who puts his head at the feet of the Lord Jesus. This is the true man. It's not the one who is muscly and goes and bashes people and breaks their heads. That is, this is not manhood. A true man is the one who has the fear of the Lord Jesus, where he comes and bows before the Lord and say, have mercy on me, Lord, and on my family. Now, this is a man. And this man must be respected. This man must be listened to. Husbands, men, you put your head before the Lord, the Lord will make sure your family will respect you. You walk away from the Lord, don't expect your family respect you. They won't. You put your head at the feet of the Lord, the Lord will make sure your family is always under your authority. So don't be deceived by so-called friends. where they pressure you to do things that are wrong. Don't go and spend the night in the Novotel Hotel overlooking the Darling Harbor. And there was about 60 or 70 of us there and we had fun. I know what you do. Boys with girls and girls with boys. And girls, I love you, you're my daughters, you're my eyes. I love you. Daughters, do not touch your body. Do not change your body. You are the temple of God. You are beautiful as you are. Don't blow your cheeks. Don't blow nothing in your body. Don't. You are beautiful to Christ the way he made you, the way he formed you and shaped you. You're beautiful. If there is anything you need to beautify is your heart. 
make a spiritual plastic surgery to your heart do you know what that spiritual plastic surgery is to your heart say to the Lord you are the surgeon for he is the only true doctor Lord come and take this heart out and put your heart instead in there this is open heart surgery take my heart out and put your heart in there Lord I want this heart to be beautiful for you Lord Jesus anyway I don't want to keep you for too long do not argue do not be stubborn about things say once in your life I'm sorry it was my fault it wasn't yours change your way of thinking change your way of life change your mentality change yourself by coming to the Lord and giving yourself to Christ and say Lord you form me and make me and shape me break me to make me wound me in order to heal me give yourself to Christ let him do whatever he wishes to do freely do not limit Christ do not put hindrance in the way of Christ just let go say Lord I'm all yours take me before Satan takes me take me Lord there is nothing in this world that is worth it to argue and fight and then hold grudges and I'm not gonna talk to you until I die come on relax relax somebody stole my rights somebody went against me this person hurt me so much bless them because by them hurting you maybe that was a benefit for you it was a credit for you maybe that was a way for your awakening bless them don't be angry with no one I beg you do not be angry with no one no matter how much they've hurt you anyone that comes to me that has stabbed me a million times in my back I will never ever open no topic with them and I will not let them to open any topic and I won't even let them to say sorry I won't if I see them hello brother if I see them hello son hello daughter I hug them I kiss them as if nothing had happened you know why because it's not about them and me it's about this sweetheart the love of my life man when I kiss his sandals I don't care anymore you love me you hate me means nothing your love for me and your hate for me nowhere near the sandals of my sweetheart Jesus ah when I put him on my head you can kick me punch me tell me off spit in my face drag me in the streets I love you brother Jesus let me touch his sandals Jesus let me put his sandals on my head man I'm flying I'm in heaven I'm in the heaven of all heavens who cares what people say or do love blend mold and disappear in Christ just dissolve in him dissolve in him what I'm saying I'm not out of my mind no because when you meet one day Jesus you'll remember what I said now you will dissolve you will dissolve because his love for you melts mountains melts mountains you will dissolve you will you'll forget everyone including yourself because Christ blows any and every mind away so Lord I'm kissing your sandals I'm polishing your sandals I'm licking your sandals all the dust that has been attached to the 
to the sole of your sandal, I'm licking them. I'm, I'm licking them, Lord. Yes. See, when you love someone from the heart, you act crazy. In the eyes of the world, you're a nutcase. You're not. They are a nutcase. But you see, they see you as a nutcase because, because whatever they are, they think everyone else is, this, is the same as them. But you see, love makes you do nutcase stuff. You'll be jumping like, like a monkey. But this is my love. This is my love. Boy, when you love a girl and you see her, don't you act like a nutcase? Hmm? When she sends you a message, oh my God, oh my, oh, I'm going, mom, dad, poor mom raised you for 20 years, begging you just to come and sit at the table. Ah, mom, get off my case. I've seen you for too long. Leave me alone. Shut the door when you go out. Don't come in. And this girl who came the other day, took you ready full package you run to her crazy you don't run to mom crazy why you crazy boy why why and you run to that girl and after one year she'll make you truly crazy you'll end up in the mental hospital brother come to me I'll call Liverpool mental hospital for you don't worry Love the Lord and love everyone. Amen? Amen. Let... No need, no need. It's all good, it's all good. Uh, you clap for the Lord Jesus, yes. Yes, amen to that, for the Lord Jesus. Yeah, come on, you clap for the Lord Jesus. I'm nothing but his humble donkey. See, the Lord loves to travel. But the only mean of his travel is the donkey. He doesn't like a limousine. He doesn't like a Mercedes Benz or a BMW convertible or a Ferrari or a Rolls Royce. He likes his vehicle to be the donkey. I said, Lord, if you may and allow me, please, you ain't going to find any better donkey than me. I'm the best of the best. I'm the donkeyest of all donkeys. So you sit on my back and drive this donkey wherever you wish to. So when people clap, the donkey should not take it for himself. <laughs> you clap for the king who sits on the donkey. Well, who cares about the donkey? The donkey you just kick it and say, get out of here. You clap for the king. So next time you clap, you clap for the king who sits on this donkey. Okay? Very good. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord Jesus, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, to make me him and let him be me. For this is the only I am that we should live in. Christ the I am. Amen. Our good God and full of mercy. Our good God and full of mercy whose grace and mercy is poured upon all. Pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants, and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes, and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace, and instill the walks of their behavior in the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith in the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will, to confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. God bless you all. If I may ask you tonight when you go home or even here in the church, I ask you to go and light a candle and say a little prayer on this intention. 
there are two beautiful angels um, that um, one of they both have cancer so um, I'm asking you all to remember pray for this intention for the Lord Jesus to inter intervene and inter and the Holy Mother intercedes with her powerful intercession and all the saints for the Lord to reach out to these beautiful little angels one is 11 and the other one I don't know 9 10 so to reach out to them and to be healed fully according to his will and to his mercy Lord have mercy on these two angels you are the healer you are the doctor that heals every illness physical mental emotional spiritual you heal everything with your precious blood and I ask you to pray all for these two angels I pray for every angel in Westmead's Children's Hospital remember everyone who is sick everyone who is hungry everyone who is afflicted everyone who is a homeless living in the gutter no shelter no room no bed in the heat in the cold what kind of a life are they going through doesn't matter they're homeless doesn't matter it's their fault or someone else's at the end this is a human being like me and you they suffer every day there is no food there is no shelter there is no nothing and above all there is no comfort they don't have someone to come and say I love you they don't have someone to come and say what would you like me to do for you where us we have a family we have people around us and in our circle ask about us but there are so many people left alone deserted remember them remember them and speaking of helping the needy we thank the almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth for his infinite mercy on this little church we are small in size but we are big in the heart from nothing he gave us everything we started with helping 10 children overseas where parents were about to give them to shelters to governments to look after them because of their financial status below poverty could not handle seeing their kids dying from starvation right before their very eyes they could not feed their children they were about to give them we thank the lord we reached out to 10 the 10 now has become within a month almost 100 kids within a month thanks first and foremost to our lord and savior jesus christ and then to all of you my beloved those who are donating financially those who are praying because everything counts and the foundational of all is the prayer but when someone donates a dollar you are saving a soul somewhere in this world we've reached out to people in the Middle East Iraq Syria Lebanon in Asia Minor Turkey in uh, Sudan in Egypt in Africa we've reached out to about in Israel there is about eight or nine countries that we've reached out to there is about a hundred kids and on the increase and I pray they become a hundred thousand kids we can do it give your dollar and give your dollar and give your dollar we can save and help so many people I'll give you an example we received a phone call two weeks ago from a blessed person in Egypt in Cairo or in Egypt and he said there is this this woman with four children the husband alcoholic bashing her up every single day the Christians from Egypt the husband finally left her with four children her father is even poorer than her they are all now living with dad I, only God knows what kind of a shelter it is I don't know he said we're trying some people donated a small piece of land we're trying to build a house for this mother and for children I said how much he said if we build a house with no kitchen and with no amenities maybe about 1500 dollars Australian
I said, I want you to put everything in that house. We send, the only reason I'm saying this is because I want you to understand what people are living, how people are living. We send them whatever amount we send. And I said, this amount, you tell that beautiful blessed person in Egypt, I said, this amount is allocated to buy all the toys and the clothes and the sweets that the heart of those children desires. This is for the, you take them shopping, let them choose whatever they want. I want them to be happy. I want them to smile. I want them to laugh. No more crying. 